<laughs> Bo said they were singing Christmas carols on the way over, so it almost feels uh, appropriate. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, we turn to 1 Timothy 3. Uh, so we've uh, been enjoying a good morning already. Um, good to have uh, Brian preaching for us today, but in our Bible uh, class hour, um, we're going to look today or continue a study we're doing on Jesus, which is uh, a good place to be studying, and uh, kind of just looking at an overview of, of the doctrine of God the Son. And uh, we looked last Sunday at the fact that he had a pre-existence, so Jesus, of course, took on flesh when he was born in Bethlehem, but he is also the eternal Son of God. Uh, and then we looked at the fact that Jesus was incarnated, and so he took on flesh, and then uh, we saw his resurrection. So 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, is kind of providing an outline for us uh, on, this, on this doctrine. Um, and uh, we'll read that verse, and then we're going we're gonna to move into the next part of our study, which is his glorification. Uh, but uh, so 1 Timothy 3, verse 16 says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So this is a really a summary uh, doctrinal uh, explanation of Christ and how he was God who was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. And the idea there, I believe, is in a sense, the evidence of his life was demonstrated um, ultimately through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so then we're going to move to this section of the verse that says, Scene of Angels. So this is an interesting one. When you think about angels in the Bible, uh, initially you might think they're not a big deal. I know some people really get excited about angels, uh, almost more so than the Lord Jesus. But angels, if you do a search on angel or angels in the Bible, you will see that the angels are actually very present all through the Scripture. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're kind of in the background a little bit, which... Um, I think is part of the idea that angels serve the Lord. They're not the focus. Um, they never wanted to be the focus. They understand who should be the focus. And, and that's a bit of a, a lesson for us because if you come across people who are really into angels, they're, they're, they're missing the point. You know, they're, you're focused on the wrong thing. They're just servants of the Lord. But scene of angels. Now, I'll let you guys kind of... Uh, interact a little bit this morning. So Jesus, his life on this earth, where, where do we see him being seen of angels? Where do we see the angels being involved in Jesus' uh, life here on this earth? Any, any thoughts? Okay, so yeah, from the, the very beginning, actually even before uh, Mary's with child, it's announced, and then, of course, to, to Joseph, and then to the shepherds. Okay, yeah, so they're, they're at the arrival. Any other times we see the angels? Okay, so then at yeah, the end there, you have the empty tomb, don't you? You know, he's not here, he's risen. <coughs> okay, yeah, they, uh, they, does it say the angel came and strengthened him? Is that right? Is that what you're thinking of, Grant? Yeah, okay, I think that's, I think that's right. I'm just gonna just gonna verify that in Matthew chapter four. Any other thoughts on when angels were present? Yes, uh, just just to verify, Matthew four eleven says, "And angels came and ministered unto him." We're gonna say something, Ryan. Okay, so his resurrection. That's right. Yes, certainly in the, in the Old Testament, we find uh, someone called the angel of the Lord, which um, there are angels who serve the Lord, but then there's the angel of the Lord, which um, 
you know, if you study that out, it's not just uh, an angel, it's, it's, it's God, you know, in, in human form, very likely uh, what is called a Christophany, which is an appearance of Jesus before his incarnation. Any other? Okay, the Garden of Gethsemane, okay, yeah. Yeah, so the angels are very aware and, and uh, watched God the Son in his ministry. Uh, let's take our Bibles and go to Philippians. I'll just show you a couple verses on this point. So go to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 9 to 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. So the angels, in one sense, kind of model for us the right attitude towards God. Um, in the Lord's Prayer, um, we read um, that it would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so in heaven, everybody does what God wants them to do. Unfortunately, on earth, very few do what God want, wants them to do. But the, our desire would to be that we would submit and follow and serve the Lord uh, in a similar way to, to the way the angels do. If we get Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11, the Bible says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So notice there in verse 9, things that are in heaven uh, will bow at the name of Jesus. So Jesus is worshipped and honored and will do bow and will bow before Jesus. Go to Hebrews chapter 1, if you will, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 6 which is an interesting couple of verses because uh, there are those who teach that um, Jesus is Michael the archangel. Uh, the, the Mormons actually, um, I don't know if they still believe that, but at one point they believe that Jesus was Michael the archangel. But here in Hebrews chapter 1, there's a distinction between Jesus and the angels. Um, and uh, if we look there in verse if we look in verse number 5, it says, Unto which of the angels said he, talking about God, at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, those, those statements, Thou art my son, this day have begotten thee, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son, they come from the Old Testament. Psalm 2 and... Um, 2 Samuel 7, where uh, God is speaking about the king of Israel and how the king of Israel enjoyed this, uh, not only the leadership of the nation of Israel, but also to be the son of God, to have God um, looking after him like a son. So there was a, a very spiritual dimension to being the king of Israel, which is prophetic as well because it's looking forward to the ultimate king of Israel, Jesus, who will return and sit on the throne of David and uh, rule over this earth. And so he says, basically, God has never given that privilege to an angel. Verse 6, and again, when he bringeth his first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So there's a real distinction between Jesus and the angels. They see the Son. This, this verse, verse 6, um, in the context here, is, is talking about his second coming. Because that's when he's going to receive that, that throne, uh, that Davidic th throne. That's when he's going to rule and reign. Uh, one of the most famous prophecies about Jesus is it Isaiah, which talks about, you know, that uh, a child is given unto us, a son is born. But one of the things it says in there is that uh, he will be given the throne of his father David. Well, that didn't happen in the first coming. He came to save, he came to redeem, but he was rejected by Israel. 
And so the government has yet to be placed upon his shoulders. He's yet to be given the throne of David. That's in the future. And when that happens, the angels are going to observe this and they are going to worship him as they already do and as all of us will do. And they are going to acknowledge that Jesus is God the Son. So it's it's not really a, an aspect of the Lord Jesus that we talk about much, but it's included in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 as an important part of who Jesus is, that he is more than just a good teacher. He's more than just, um, you know, a great example. He is God come in human, human form, died, rose again, and is going to be worshipped by all of all of humanity and also all of the angels. Um, I was, I'm reading in Ephesians right now, my devotions, and one of the... Uh, one of the things, look in Ephesians, I'll, sh I'll show you this one. Look in Ephesians chapter 3. One of the purposes for what God is doing in the church is to show to the powers and principalities His manifold wisdom. And principalities and powers are like levels of, of um, angels and spirit beings uh, that... Satan and his fallen ones, and also the angels that haven't fallen, um, he's going to demonstrate to that realm his incredible wisdom. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 10. It says, um, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So, it's you know, we tend to view everything from, from our perspective. You know, if you're... If you're American, you have this view of the world. If you are not American, you have this view of the world. If you leave maybe your home country, if you leave and go to, you get a different perspective. Well, as, as sinners in need of a Savior, we view Jesus through the lens of, in the great He died to save us. But from God's perspective, there's more going on than just our salvation. There's the glory of God, the wisdom of God and how not only will we worship Him, but all created beings will give honor and glory and recognize Jesus as Lord, uh, whether willingly or, or kind of unwillingly. So, scene of angels. Probably more to that. Um, it's, it's, it's not something we, we are familiar with a lot. But let's, let's go to the next point then. So go back to 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, and notice the next thing, preached unto the, unto the Gentiles. So, God the Son glorified, then God the Son's gospel, the gospel of God the Son. Preached unto the Gentiles, as scandalous as it seemed to the Jews, the Jewish Messiah was the Savior of the world. The message that God came into the world, died on the cross, paying for the sins of all men, and rising again is one that is destined for all people, Jew and Gentile alike. Of course, preached to the Jews, but preached to the Gentiles was something that was a surprise and a shock uh, to the Jewish people. Let's take our Bibles and go to Mark chapter 16. So if we're going to talk about God the Son, we, we talk about His gospel, the good news of God the Son. Um, Mark 16, let's look at verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So this gospel is to be preached in all the world and to every creature. That's something we need reminded of, isn't it? Uh, it's easy to think, well, you know, I've told my family, I've told my friends, but what about the world that has no saved friends or family? Uh, what about people who've never heard? Uh, what about people who don't even have access to the gospel? And we really have to realize that the gospel is to be preached unto everyone. 
Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's a message that is good news for all people, and all people should believe. Look at verse number 16. It's not, the gospel is not kind of like a, a bonus, you know, an additional, you know, uh, extra you can add to your, your package. The gospel is the package, so to speak. It is essential because look at verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Those are very strong words. I mean, damn is almost a word that, you know, you don't really, it's kind of one of those words you shouldn't say lightly or flippantly because it's the one that believes not will go to hell. The one that goes not or believes not will be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. So what makes a difference? It's the gospel. The person that believes will uh, and is baptized will be saved. The one that believes not will be damned. Of course, we sometimes people get a little bit confused and think that baptism here is part of salvation or part of how you are saved. But notice the essential part here is belief. And the baptism uh, is crucial as well, but it's crucial as a, as a fruit or as a result of that faith, as a demonstration. It's, a, it's an outward manifestation of it, of your inward belief. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I wear a, a wedding band. If I take my wedding band off, it doesn't mean I'm not married. But if I keep wanting to take my wedding band off and not wear it, you'd be kind of like, it's kind of weird. And, it's, and so baptism is like so closely connected because if you love Jesus, you'll want to declare that. And that's what baptism does, does for us. But it's crucial, isn't it? So think about your friends and your family. Have they believed the gospel? Think about your neighbors. Think about people you've, who, who you've never met. I mean, it, it, we were ch chatting earlier, but one of the things that's so, so concerning right now is not only are there people that are lost, but are they being told? I mean, there's people all over this city that don't know Jesus. That's bad enough, but have they heard? And are, we, are they being told? And so they need to hear the gospel. Okay, so preached unto the Gentiles, um, believed on in the world, and people must believe the gospel to be saved. Let's go to 1 John, if we can, 1 John. So 1 John chapter 2, let's look at verses 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So what we do with the Son determines our salvation. If we deny the Son, we don't have the Father. You can't say... You know God, you believe in God if you reject Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way that we come to the Father. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So Jesus is is the key. He's the door, he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. Okay, then let's uh, talk about the ascension of God the Son. So our kind of our, our outline text, 1 Timothy 3, 16, then finishes by saying, received up into glory. So that's talking about the ascension of Christ back into glory. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus gave final words of instruction to wait for the Holy Spirit to come so that they could then tell others who he was and what he had done. And then the Bible says he ascended back into heaven. A cloud received them out of their sight in Acts chapter number 1. And so he returned back uh, to God and resumed his, his seat at the right hand of God. Mark 16, 19 says, After the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. So he was 
Uh, he even prayed in John 17. He said, you know, uh, give me the glory that I had with you before the world began. So it's, it's coming back full circle. Jesus is back. He's seated at the right hand of God. The ascension of Jesus is yet further proof that he came from heaven originally. John chapter 6 and verse 62 Jesus says, What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. That's why the teaching of Jesus was so profound and remarkable, is you have the eternal God who has spent all of eternity in heaven. He is God. He comes down, and, and the world is looking at him thinking he looks ordinary, but he's totally uh, un unordinary. He's totally uh, extraordinary. Thank you. <laughs> I, knew, I knew there was a, a word I was looking for. Extraordinary. Uh, because he's from God and he's going back. He's going back, back to where he was before. I just think that's an ama amazing verse. What is he doing in heaven? Hebrews 7.25 says, uh, He ever lives to make intercession for them or for, for us. So he's in heaven now and he's our intercessor. He's our advocate. He is our, um, our spokesperson and he's praying for us. He's interceding for us. And that's an amazing, amazing thought as well. So Jesus has ascended back to heaven. Then the final kind of aspect we'll look at on the doctrine of God the Son is his return. The return. Now that's not actually mentioned in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, but I want to cover it because this is very relevant to us, isn't it? The return of Christ. And this is something, first of all, if you're a Christian, we should be very comforted by the Lord's return. And all the promises for the Christian about the Lord's coming are ones of comfort. He's the blessed hope. It doesn't mean that we'll not go through any difficulties. Um, I believe in a rapture that's going to happen before the day of the Lord, before the tribulation period. But that doesn't mean we won't go through some pre-tribulation tribulation. It doesn't mean we won't go through some difficult times. But ultimately, the coming of the Lord brings the child of God comfort. Now, the unbeliever, it's not the same. They are overtaken like, a, like, like you're overtaken when a thief comes in. You're surprised. And not only has the thief surprised you, but the thief has, has destroyed things and taken things. So the coming of the Lord for the unbeliever is very different. But for the believer, we should be comforted by the knowing our Lord is coming back for us. Okay, so let me show you a couple of passages on this. Um, first of all, just quote a couple. Acts 1, 10, and 11, when he, when he goes back, when he ascends up, the angels say, Why do you stand gazing in heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so, shall so come. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll, we'll look there in just a minute. And if you remember, while you're turning there, let me just... I'll give you another reminder of another verse, John 14, where Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. As if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we find the Bible giving us some more comfort in this regard particular because of the rapture. So let's look starting in verse number 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So notice there, first of all, he is writing this to provide comfort. He is writing this really to comfort them in regards to their to Christians who've already passed, passed away. And he says, I don't, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware. And I don't want you to have the same type of sorrow that the world has. Okay, so what was it that was going to come for them? Well, he says that the Lord's going to descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those that are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So Jesus is coming, and he is coming for the dead in Christ. He's coming for those that are alive and remain, those that are um, believers in Christ, and he's going to catch us away. Now, if you study carefully the language here, it's very different from other passages that talk about Jesus coming to the earth. You can look at Revelation 19. You can look at other verses in Matthew 24 and 25. But there seems to be a there seems to be two phases to the Lord's return. One in the air for those that are in Christ, which is language that's used only to describe the church, believers in Jesus after his death and his resurrection and ascension, and after the Holy Spirit comes and, and baptizes um, believers into one body, the church. So the language there is different from other passages that say he's going to come to the earth. Here it's in the air. Here it's for the, the church. In Revelation 19, he comes to the earth, and that is when he sets up his kingdom and judges. So now, if, you know, if you only believe in, if you don't believe in the rapture, you know, that's, that's not like fundamental to the, to the gospel. But I would point out to you, if you look with me there, the same passage, look at verse 14. He says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So the, the teaching of the rapture is, he says, it's, it's as um, it's connected and it's almost uh, as, as verifiable as the fact that Jesus died and rose again. Do you see the connection there? He says, if you believe Jesus rise, died and rose again, then you can believe that those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Um, so it's, it should provide great hope to us. And I think if you carefully look at it, it's very difficult to deny the teaching of the rapture, uh, and it's to provide great hope for the believer. Now, if we can just go to chapter 5, same, same book, um, and sometime maybe we'll do more of a study on this, um, but look at 1 Thessalonians 5. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord sh uh, so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, so you, can you see that there's two different groups of people. There's the they's and the them's, and then there's the ye's, the, and the brothers, and then the sisters. Ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. They that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. And let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we shall live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also you do. Now, if you notice there, so he teaches them about the rapture. He says, I'm going to teach you about the rapture. But then in chapter 5, he says, I don't need to teach you about the day of the Lord. 
I don't need to teach you about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a term talking about God's um, program in which he pours out his wrath on this world and sets up his kingdom. It begins with the Antichrist being revealed, and it goes all the way through to when the new heavens and the new earth, uh, or, the, or the, the old heaven and the old earth, one we're in, are destroyed. You see that in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. So it's a term that's talking about ultimately God's day of wrath. And it, the Old Testament talks a lot about it. It's a day of darkness and gloominess and judgment and fire. And, you know, and you read Revelation, you're like, oh. And he says, but I don't need to teach you about that because you can read the whole Testament and learn about the day of the Lord. He says, you know that it's going to come like a thief in the night. Verse 4, he says, you're not in darkness. You're not, the Christian should not be surprised by the Lord's coming. But look what he says. He says in verse number 9, God has not appointed us to wrath. Now, that is, that's not just talking about hell. Because in the context, it's talking about the day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment on this earth. And he says, you have no appointment with that day. Now, does that mean that we won't go through periods of difficulty as a Christian? Absolutely not. But the day when God is pouring out his wrath on this world, the day when God is, is showing the world, I am God, and I'm going to teach everybody a lesson, and you will not blaspheme, and you will not rebel anymore, he says, you don't have an appointment with that day. You're... You're a child of God. You're, you're a believer in Jesus. He has not appointed you to that day, but you will obtain salvation. And again, salvation here, we might think, well, that's when you get saved. Yes and no, it's when you get saved, but the idea here is it's when all the saved are not just saved from sin's penalty, but they're saved from sin's present, and they are rescued out of this world. And so he says, comfort yourselves together. So... There is a day of God's wrath coming, and we may see indications that things are getting worse and worse, but when that day finally comes, the Antichrist is revealed, the world comes under the wrath of God, and the things that are talked about in the book of Revelation, he says, you're not appointed to that day. So Jesus is coming back. It's going to be in two phases, the rapture and the revelation at the end of the the, the seven-year period that's often called a tribulation. And if you're not saved, you're going you're, you're gonna, to you're gonna regret it because you, you don't have this promise of deliverance. But if you are saved, you can be comforted with the fact that we're not appointed unto wrath. Um, let me see if I can show you one other. Look at, let me just give you one other quick verse, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. But... Um, Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, it says, To wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So there's another promise that we're not going to go through the wrath that is to come. There's more we could talk about on that, but just gives you a bit of an overview. So what does this mean for us? It means that God was manifest for us. God loves us. He came to die for us. He's conquered death. God the Son should be honored and glorified just as the angels honor Him. Jesus is now in heaven making intercession for us, and He's coming back. He's coming back to take us out of this world, to right all the wrongs, and to rule and reign forever. And our hope is not in a new president. Our hope is not in a new government. Our hope is not in a new world order. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a blessed hope. All right, let's pray, and then we'll have a little break before the uh, service. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that uh, you loved us, you gave yourself for us, and that you're coming back for us. And uh, Lord, in these days in which we live, uh, we feel as if your return is very soon. Uh, and we know that it's certainly sooner than it's ever been. And so I pray you'll help us to be ready, help us to be uh, preaching the gospel, help us to be busy serving you um, and doing all we can uh, to reach out with the gospel. For those who may not be ready, I pray, God, that they place their faith and trust in you uh, and so they can be prepared. 
we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to have a great time in the service. If you're listening, definitely tune in here in about 10 minutes. You're really going to enjoy the, the message.